Noel's finding out some information for me, and he's then going to lead the singing of the hymns. But we're going to start with 196. I'd better lead it until he gets it back up here again. 196. Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly, while the nearer waters roll, while the tempest still is high. 196, and we're going to stand as we sing.
Let's unite our hearts together in prayer. Our gracious God, we thank thee that we are able to come before the living God, the one who rules over the affairs of men. We can say, Sovereign Ruler of the skies, ever gracious, ever wise, all my times are in thy hand, all events at thy command. We thank you, O God, that there is none beside thee. We do not desire any other God than the living, the true, the Almighty, the one who sees us, the one who understands us, and the one who cares for us. We thank you for that text that we have thought about today, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Thank you, Lord, for such care, such tender love. Thank you for the proof of that love in the coming of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, into this world. He has come, we know, to seek and to save that which was lost. We thank you for his perfect sacrifice on the accursed tree. We thank you for a price paid in full. And we thank you for his resurrection on the third day. Thank you for the proof that he was alive. For thy word says that he showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. And how we thank thee that it is true. Christ conquered death. Christ paid the price for sin. Christ rose again. Christ ascended. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And we thank you that he ever liveth to make intercession for all who come to God by him. As we bow before thee, we pray that thy hand will be upon us today. We pray that thy presence will be real in this service tonight. From commencement to conclusion, let us appreciate thy nearness. Let us know that thou art here. Remember every aspect of the service. Bless our singing. Bless the singing of our sister who will minister in song. We pray our God that thou wilt bless in the reading and the proclamation of holy truth. This is a message, O God, that is in thy word. Lord, thou hast told us that it is by the foolishness of preaching that God saves those who believe. Be pleased to speak to unsaved men and women, young people. Be pleased to speak to those who are drifting and going astray and losing their footing spiritually. Let thy mercy be extended to them. Let them see that this is serious, that we stand uh, before God as those who will give account one day. And let us see too that this life will soon be over and only what we have done in thy service and in obedience to thy will will be of any lasting worth. Look down upon us and our undertake not just for ourselves, but for every similar gathering, whether in this land or in some other land, whether a, a land that is near or a land that is far off, let thy truth prevail. We thank you that thou hast promised that the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Lord, fill this earth with the knowledge of truth. Thou art able, thou art a glorious God. Let thy great name be praised from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. Hear, O God, and answer prayer. Remember those who cannot be with us. Remember those who are cast down. Remember those who are healing. And, O God, remember those who are infirm. Hear this, our cry. Cleanse us from every stain of sin and pour out thy spirit in the midst. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our second hymn is number 550. 550. He who would valiant be against all disaster. Number 550. Let us all stand to sing.
Now we're pleased to have Mrs. Sarah Watterson with us uh, to sing for us tonight, and we're going to ask her if she would come and bring her first messages and song, please. I couldn't remember her name, and Noel went on and got it for me, and it's on the back of an envelope that says gift for church, and there's something inside, so I better make sure I don't take it home with me. So I better not delay our sister. Thank you.
Well, we do thank our sister for those two beautiful messages and song, and I do trust the Lord will bless them to our hearts. That's a beautiful hymn, uh, the uh, fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. How precious it is that the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. We're going to read now from 1 Peter chapter 5. We read this chapter this morning, and we're going to read it again this evening. 1 Peter chapter 5. And we'll commence our reading at the opening verse of the chapter. First Peter chapter 5, and commencing at the opening verse of the chapter. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being ensamples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, a faithful brother, unto you as I suppose I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein ye stand. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus my son. Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll end our reading there at the end of that fifth and final chapter of First Peter, trusting that God will add his blessing.
to the reading of his own inspired and holy truth. For Christ's sake, amen. I'm going to have the announcements for the week ahead, and our brother, Mr. Lavelle McElroth, will bring those uh, announcements. Well, good evening, everyone. Good to see you along our evening gospel service. I want to give you a warm welcome, and good to have some visitors with us as well. Uh, we give a special welcome there. See the Reverend Andrew Murray from Ardara along with us tonight. We give him a special welcome, and others as well who are gathered in this evening. And those gathering online, we give you a welcome uh, too, uh, as well to the Reverend uh, Ferguson for coming and preaching for us today at both meetings. While the Reverend Gray is on holiday, we thank him for that, and we certainly enjoyed uh, this morning's message, and we're looking forward to God's Word in a few minutes again. We want to thank Sarah for coming over and singing those lovely pieces, and we're going to hear from you in just a moment again. We thank you for coming along tonight. The announcements on their brief, we'll try and keep this as brief as we can uh, for the incoming week, Lord willing, are as follows. Please remember, Tuesday at 8 is the mid midweek prayer meeting and Bible study, and the Reverend Baxter will be along to take the meeting uh, on Tuesday night. Remember, next Lord's Day, meetings as usual, uh, 11.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. Uh, both meetings preceded by the time of prayer, and next week the preacher at both services will be Mr. Uh, Phil Moffat from Balamoni. The singer next Lord's Day evening will be Natasha Atchison. Just to recap very briefly on some of the announcements in relation to the children's work, please remember Friday the 1st of September at 7 p.m. there will be a special fun night for the primary school children. Remember Friday the 8th uh, of September at 7 p.m. is a special fun night for uh, the youth from our town, for the secondary school age children. So please remember these nights. And of course, on Friday the 15th of September at 7, all of the meetings, children's meeting, children's meeting plus, and the youth meeting for the children from our town uh, will all recommence. And if you can help in any way uh, at any of those meetings, please let our brother Philip Beatty or Margaret know uh, as soon as you possibly uh, can. Daphne is asked to remind you about the a return date for the toddlers, which is Wednesday the 20th of September at 10 a.m. And again, if anyone could help out with the snacks and tea uh, for that work, then she would appreciate that as well. Sunday school is back Sunday the 10th of September, and if there's any of the younger children um, that need enrolled in Sunday school, then see our brother Mervyn as soon as possible with those names. I think these are all of the announcements. We'll hand back to the Reverend Ferguson. I'd like to thank our brother for the welcome here to Tandragee. It's nice to be with you. And he answered one question for me there. I wasn't sure if our sister was going to sing another time. I forgot to ask her, uh, but he has made it clear that she is going to. Uh, our offering him, and we keep our seats during it, is 546 onward Christian soldiers marching as to war. 546. Let us sing this lovely hymn, keep our seats while we sing.
I do thank our brother Noel for leading the singing for us uh, tonight. I did explain this morning uh, that I had a touch of the cold. I was in the Isle of Man last Sunday, and I was there on the Saturday. Went out without a cap, and when your hair is getting thin, you're better to have a cap on. And I uh, ended up with the cold. So uh, I thank Noel uh, for leading the singing. Uh, I don't think he has noticed, but he sang one verse twice over while the congregation were singing a different verse. And uh, uh, I shouldn't mention that, really. He, would be, he has done very well. He's singing, you're singing a lot better than you would be, uh, even if I were singing the right verse with you. Um, our sister's going to come and sing for us again, please. I think I'm going to have to change my song for it's not wanting to play here. So just bear with me a wee minute till I pick something else. <laughs> Sorry. Once again, we're very grateful to our sister for 
ministering in song for us. And we do trust once again that the Lord will bless uh, that message in song. We're going to bow together very briefly in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we pray thou wilt bless us now as we turn to thy word. Fill me, I pray thee, with thy spirit. Breathe thy spirit out. Let us hear thy voice. Let us feel thy loving touch. And let us know thy power. Hear and answer prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text is found in verses 8 and 9 of 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verses 8 and 9. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Uh, this morning we were looking at verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And we saw that there is a God, a great God, who cares for us and is willing and able to handle all our anxieties and all our fears. And we are invited to come to him, to bring all our anxieties, all our worries and fears to him, and to cast them upon him. And we saw that that word cast has the idea of lifting them, and we might say uh, throwing them down uh, upon uh, the Savior. And he's able and he's willing uh, to help us. And now tonight, I want you to see that we have on the other side a deadly enemy who is also very interested in us. Your adversary, the devil, that's what the Bible speaks of, and he's as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. And the first thing I want you to see is this. The devil is an enemy whose aim is to destroy you and me. Now, the devil doesn't know uh, who may prove false after making a profession of faith. I believe that is uh, also implicit in the text. He's walking about seeking whom he may devour. You and I may have made a profession of faith, but the devil doesn't know absolutely whether it is genuine or false. And therefore, he is seeking uh, to probe us, to test us, to tempt us, to persecute us, in order uh, to destroy us. And it's only the Lord who knows truly those who are his. We read in 2 Timothy 2 and 19, the Lord knoweth them that are his. You might say this is a bit disconcerting the way you're speaking. And many of us profess to be saved. Uh, we came to meetings. We heard the gospel. Uh, we cried to the Lord for mercy. We turned from our sins. Yes, I'm not in any way undermining that. But we need to be sure. And we need to be certain as to who we belong to. Christ said to Peter uh, shortly before he went to the cross, cross, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Now, you think about that. Christ says to Peter, Satan hath desired to have you. That's plural in the original. And it means Satan desired to have all of the apostles. And he wanted to test them. He wanted to see uh, what metal they were of, whether they were genuine or whether they were false. He already, uh, at that stage, I believe, had detected that there was one false disciple, and that was Judas Iscariot. And uh, he tempted Judas. He led Judas into a desire for money and into a desire for possessions. And then when Judas went out to do the nefarious deed, the Bible says... Satan entered his heart. He entered into Judas. And when Judas went out, the Bible says it was night. It wasn't just night outside. It was dark within, as far as Judas Iscariot was concerned. We read of a man called Demas. And Demas was commended by the Apostle Paul in his letters. And yet, in his last letter, Paul said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. He looked like a disciple. He stood with the Apostle Paul. 
Just as Judas had stood with Christ and as Judas had preached the word, probably Demas preached the word, and yet he proved to be an apostate. We think of Gehazi in the Old Testament. And Gehazi was the close companion, the attendant of the great prophet Elisha. And yet he coveted money and he lied and he deceived. And it seems he was never a child of God. We read of others in church history. One man that was noted by many of the reformers was a man by the name of Francis Spira. This man professed to be a follower of Christ and he adhered to the Lutheran church. And yet when he came under pressure, he turned his back and he proved himself to be an apostate. Satan probes us, he tempts us, he persecutes us, he slanders us, and he's seeking to find out the weak points and to see whether we're really committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember how he thought about Job. Job was a genuine believer, but the devil was surveying him and watching him very closely. And his idea was, if I can thoroughly test him, and if I can take away all his possessions from him, if I can take away his health from him, he will turn round and he will curse God and prove himself to be no true follower. He's only serving the Lord for what he gets from him. And that's what the level said uh, to the Lord. He wanted to test Job. He wanted to see what Job was made of. And uh, that's why in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, we are told, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. You have a duty of self-examination to look and to see whether you're really, truly a child of God. Don't say, I made a profession 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 5 years ago. Don't say that. Look and see, uh, what is your life like? Is it consistent with the profession that you have made? Didn't Christ say, by their fruits ye shall know them? When you come to the little epistle of James, and when I was uh, uh, looking after Mullet Lass, or at least helping out in Mullet Lass, I went through uh, that little epistle of James. I had some 27 messages on it. Uh, and perhaps the people thought it was a very long book, longer than the book of Psalms by the time I had finished dealing with it. But in the epistle of James, you have a very practical book, and that book tests our faith. And it says in its key verse, be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving somebody. Deceiving other people? No. Deceiving your own selves. Uh, the, uh, the great reformer Martin Luther misunderstood the epistle of James. He called it a strawy epistle. He thought that James was teaching salvation by works. He mentions in chapter 2, Abraham, justified by works. He mentions Rahab, justified by works. And Luther assumed uh, that uh, James was teaching uh, that salvation comes by good works, by the way you live your life. That is not what James was teaching. James was simply saying, the evidence of real faith is how you live your life. There's the proof that you're really a child of God when you love the Lord, when you walk with God, when you're holy, and when you serve the Lord in obedience. I watched a television program, or part of it, uh, I suppose a few weeks ago, and it was dealing with catastrophes that took place with bridges suddenly collapsing. Sometimes there was no loss of life. Other times uh, cars plunged uh, many feet down and people lost their lives. And one of the reasons uh, was metal fatigue. That bridge or those bridges all needed to be carefully inspected to see, is there a weak point? Is that bridge in danger of collapsing imminently? What can we do uh, to safeguard that bridge so that vehicles going over it uh, will not suddenly fall uh, many feet and the passengers and driver of the vehicle fall to their death. Yes, uh, an examination of those bridges would have prevented many calamities and many people from losing their lives. Now what we're talking about is much more serious. Much more serious 
Uh, because uh, it says, examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. A bridge collapsing can cost you your life. A false profession, if you die with that false profession on your lips, will cost you your soul and you may be ruined. So there's a warning here, a warning about how we live our lives, whether we're genuine or whether we are false professors. And I ask you this question, is there evidence? Is there evidence in your life that you belong to Christ? And may I say something more here? If the devil can't get us to deny Christ, he will seek to ruin our testimony or to destroy our children or other people uh, that are very dear to us. Think of David. David was truly saved. And I know David fell deeply and David repented. It's one of the saddest sections of the Word of God when you read about David. I remember hearing of a professor in a Bible college, and it was said that every time he read the account of David's fall into sin, he wept. And that's the way you feel when you read about David. You read about the, the young hero who delivered the lamb out of the mouth of the bear and out of the mouth of the lion, the young hero who fought against Goliath, who led his people, who was triumphant in battle after battle, who was brave beyond bravery. And then you see him, after you've admired him, falling into sin. And what an impact, what an impact that had on David's family. At the end of his life, he spoke about his household, his family. And he said, although my house be not so with God. Things are not right in the family. He had sons who were dead already, who were in hell. He had comfort in his own salvation. He could see, hath made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things, and sure, for this is all my salvation and all my desire. And then he throws in that little word at the end, though he make it not to grow. It hasn't grown to encompass all my sons and all my daughters. That's what I would have loved. How tragic that the devil got in and the devil marred the testimony of David. And I mentioned this morning, we see generations missing from the house of God. And that is a tragedy. And that leads us into a second point, to probe more deeply into the character of the one who has set out to destroy us. The Bible says, the devil, your adversary, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And that word devour, it means to swallow up greedily. He's on the lookout and he's surveying you, maybe as you sit in this meeting, maybe the devil isn't personally here, but he has his cohorts, they're called demons, evil spirits, and they're watching, watching us to see if we can be tempted into sin, if we can be pulled away from that which is true and right and good. Now, as we think about the devil, I would say there is a great deal of mystery attached to the devil. We don't know why he rebelled against God, but we do know that he did rebel, that he turned against God, and he has an inveterate hatred towards God. And I'll add this. He has an inveterate hatred towards mankind. He does not love one human being. Not one. It is a dreadful, and he is so evil that Christ said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Swift was his judgment when he sinned against God and sought to set his throne above the throne of God. <coughs> Verse 8 of our text describes him. It describes him as an adversary. Now that word that is translated adversary is found just five times in the New Testament. And on the other four occasions, it is found in a legal setting. Matthew 5, 25, Agree with thine adversary quickly whilst thou art on the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. So you see it's connected 
uh, with the court of law. And you're talking here about an enemy that is very skillful. Uh, I'm going to quote a case uh, of uh, being in a court, uh, watching uh, the late Desmond Bowl. He was defending Dr. Paisley and others. I think the year was 1977 in Ballymena. And Dr. Paisley and others were accused of obstructing the police in the prosecution of their duty. And Desmond Bowl uh, was uh, the defense QC. Uh, and how brilliant he was uh, in that case. He set the case up. He interviewed uh, uh, or cross-examined police officers uh, and others. And then he summed the whole case up. And when the uh, magistrate or judge uh, came to deliver his verdict, it seemed to me that he agreed with every word that Desmond Bowl had said, and Dr. Paisley and the others were acquitted, completely cleared of obstructing the police in the prosecution of their duty. And why am I bringing this as an illustration? Because of the skill of someone uh, who is either defending or prosecuting in a court of law. When it speaks of the devil here, as an adversary, uh, one is uh, set before us uh, who is very skillful. He knows everything about us. Uh, he knows our weak points. He knows what we have done. He knows what you have done, what I have done. And sometimes our sins be come before us and we're horrified. Uh, and we have to go to the Lord afresh and plead, plead the blood of Jesus Christ and ask for God's mercy and for his help. As sins, maybe sins long since forgotten, are brought before us. The devil knows everything about us. He's very skillful. And uh, also, uh, you will find something more uh, about the devil. Uh, you will discover uh, that uh, the devil uh, is diabolical. Uh, why do I say that? Because he's your adversary, the devil. Uh, and that word devil is the Greek word diabolus. If you read The Holy War by John Bunyan, uh, the, the chief enemy uh, of Emmanuel is diabolus. Bunyan showing us Christ Emmanuel on one side, diabolus the devil on the other. And the word diabolus, it means a false accuser. The devil will not always uh, tell you uh, the things that he knows about you, uh, he will seek also to mislead you and to lead you uh, into believing a lie. What did Christ say? He said, he is a liar and the father of it. How does the devil come and uh, tell us lies? Well, he may speak as he spoke to Eve in the Garden of Eden. Uh, he, he spoke to her and he asked her a question. Seemed so innocent, didn't it? Yea, hath God said, uh, you're not allowed to eat from every tree in the garden. And the woman replies, we may eat of the trees, but uh, we're, there's one tree we're not allowed to eat from, the tree of the knowledge and good, of good and evil, lest we die. And what did this, the devil say? Ye shall not surely die. That was a lie. That was a lie. And how does he lie to us? Well, to some people, he says, there is no God. There is no God. In spite of all the evidence, there is no God. And many people are willing to swallow that lie. Uh, I have uh, a little booklet in the house that the Reverend David Linton wrote. Excellent little book. I gave it out uh, in the area I live in and further afield. And he has many quotations uh, from those who believe in evolution and those who believe the Bible. Wonderful quotations from people like Sir Michael Faraday and Sir Isaac Newton who believed the Bible. And then quotations from those who did not believe the Bible. Uh, Professor George Walt, professor of biology at Harvard University who won the Nobel Prize in biology. And he says that there's only two alternatives. Uh, you either believe in what he calls spontaneous generation, uh, that's evolution just happening without a cause, or you believe in supernatural creation. 
He says that spontaneous generational evolution was disproved by Louis Pasteur and others. And he says, yet I choose to believe in it. I choose to believe in something I know to be impossible because I do not want to believe in God. Why does he not want to believe in God? Deceived. Deceived by the devil. And then he quotes another man, a mathematician, Dr. Carl Sagan. And Dr. Sagan, I've often quoted this in preaching recently, Dr. Carl Sagan tells us that the odds against evolution are 1 in 10 to the power of 2 billion. And to simplify it, he says, to write out the odds, you would need 600 books of 300 pages each just to write out the odds against evolution. Sorry, I should have said 6,000 books of 300 pages each. And what you need is 1,800,000 pages just to write out the odds against evolution. And that's the most simple forms of evolution he's speaking about. And yet Carl Sagan, Carl Sagan believed in evolution. He believed the lie of the devil rather than believe what is in the Word of God. devil will tell you that sin's not a terrible thing, as Christians tell you, as Christian preachers tell you. It's, it's only a small thing. God would never send you to hell for a few little failures on your part. Uh, indeed, he might say to some, there isn't a heaven. There isn't a hell. That's what he'd certainly say. Uh, and uh, when ungodly people die, all the eulogies are paid to them. Uh, and if there's any thought of heaven, uh, my, they're entertaining the angels up in heaven. When all the time they are languishing in hell itself. Devil says there's plenty of time. He has a multitude of lies to lead men and women astray, to lead them into sin. He's skillful. He's also diabolical. And uh, he is cruel. As a roaring lion, he walketh about. I remember mentioning something about the roar of the lion where I was preaching somewhere. And a man uh, spoke to me afterwards. He told me he was out, I think it was a nature reserve or safari park, or he was close to it. And it was uh, in the twilight. It was getting dark. Uh, and he forgot where he was. And he heard this awful roar that scared him out of his wits. He didn't know that the lion was caged, or at least it uh, was within bounds. But the roar of the lion really terrified him. And isn't it true? The devil intimidates. We're afraid to speak up for Christ. Unsaved people are afraid of the consequences of coming to Christ. Your friends will laugh at you. Your life will change. All the fun will go out of your life. You're going to have a very dull existence. And the lie of the devil intimidates people, holds them back, holds Christians back from witnessing. People say, oh, I couldn't go around the doors. I couldn't speak to people about getting saved. I couldn't do that. I'm very shy. They're not shy when they're talking about football and the team that they support and uh, whether they're going to win the league. And they're not shy about analyzing every player in the team and the manager of the team and pouring scorn upon uh, teams that they don't support. They're not shy about that. But they're shy about opening their mouths and saying one word for Jesus Christ in case they might be laughed at. Someone would laugh at you. Oh, isn't that a very weak excuse that someone would laugh at you for standing up for Christ? Look what Christians had to suffer in days gone by. Look how Christians during the Inquisition were stretched on the rack, men and women, till their, uh, their bodies were, uh, were dislocated, their joints were dislocated. They suffered terribly. And if they didn't turn afresh to Rome, uh, then they were put back again on the rack and stretched even more. And finally, they lost their lives. Christians in the time of Roman power were brought into the Colosseum and torn to pieces by lions and other wild animals. And then we think of uh, what happened to the Waldensians, Christians who originated in the 12th century. They were brought uh, to the 
the top of the Alps, or at least to Alpine peaks, and they were hurled to their death. Mothers, children, fathers. And John Milton, the poet, uh, wrote, Avenge, O Lord, thy slaughtered saints, whose bones lie scattered on the Alpine mountains cold. Yes, there they were, hurled, hurled down the slopes to their deaths. And the devil, in his cruelty to men and women, wants to inflict as much misery and suffering as he can. He wants to destroy us. Now, isn't it strange that society is horrified, and rightly horrified, at the killing of premature babies by that nurse, Lucy Letby? It's been all over the news these last few days. Horrendous. Seven premature babies killed. Uh, six others that she attempted to kill, according to the judgment of the court, and it's suspected there may have been others. Society is horrified. Our news bulletins are read, are led by this news. But society is not horrified at the killing of unborn children. There's far more children have been killed legally in order to, to give the woman her rights. And we're not laying all the blame on the poor woman. Many times she has cajoled into it. Many times she has put under pressure. How tragic, how wicked, how cruel. And who is behind all of this, you might say? Who is behind the killing of the children? Who is behind the slaughter of the saints and has been behind the slaughter of the saints down through the centuries? Of course, it is the devil. Christ not only said that he was a liar from the beginning in John 8 and 44, but he says he is a murderer. The devil's a murderer. So much mayhem, so many killings, beginning with the murder of Abel. Right to this day, people are being killed. Murder after murder after murder is being committed. And the devil's behind it. But not only is he interested in destroying the bodies of men and women, but he's a murderer of the soul. You see, if we listen to him, we will lose our souls, and we will lose our souls eternally. He's cruel, he's skillful, he's a liar, and he seeks to intimidate us and to destroy us. Be sober, be vigilant, the apostle says, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now the picture is very bleak and we need to ask the question, how, and this is my last point, how can we overcome the devil? And the truth is he can. He can be overcome. In 1 John 4 and verse 4, John says to us, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the devil. James 4 and verse 7 says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Romans 16 and verse 20, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Rome, says that God shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. And, and that is it actually an image that is drawn from the Old Testament, uh, from the book of Joshua in chapter 10. Uh, when Joshua was marching through, taking possession at God's command, the promised land, he came up against five kings who were in concert, uh, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon. And then, when he had great success... And those kings had been captured. He brought them out. And he made them lie down on the ground. And he said to his captains, Step forward and place your foot on the necks of those kings. And you can see those captains. You can see those kings. They lie down. They're defeated. Absolutely defeated. And a captain steps forward he sets his foot on the neck of the king of Jerusalem. Another captain steps forward. 
he sets his foot on the king of Hebron's neck, and so on. And there's all five, and they are completely in the power of Joshua's captains, completely in Joshua's power. The Lord is going to place Satan beneath our feet, and the Bible says shortly, in a very short time, may seem long to us, but in a very short time, Satan, Satan that people listen to today, Satan that people allow to deceive them and to cheat them out of salvation and out of a home in heaven, Satan is going to be placed beneath our feet. You know, it's a disgrace to a military leader if he loses a battle to a less skillful, worse equipped, and much smaller force. You say, how did he lose? How did he lose that battle? He had the men, uh, he had the equipment, and they had the skill. (coughs) Uh, These were veterans. These men knew how to fight. How did that general lose that battle? It's a disgrace. Well, now apply it. Think, think of it this way. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. God shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. If we have more strength than all the forces of darkness combined, isn't it a disgrace for us to listen to the devil, uh, to be cajoled by the devil into fear, or cajoled into denying the Lord and doing that which is evil in the sight of God? What failures uh, we are when we give in to the voice of the devil and heed his advice and succumb to his temptations and to the temptations of the world that is under his control. You know that Churchill spoke of a Field Marshal Lord Montgomery. Uh, He wasn't field marshal probably at the time. He used the words. He was probably known as General Montgomery. And he said that Montgomery was insufferable in victory. (laughs) Uh, I don't know if he was, but that's how Churchill regarded him. But he added something more that was far uh, more pleasing. He said he was indomitable in defeat. In other words, he might have had setbacks, but you couldn't conquer Montgomery. Bernard Montgomery, later Field Marshal Lord Montgomery, he couldn't be defeated because he would battle on uh, and uh, no matter about the setback, uh, he would triumph in the end. Interestingly, Lord Montgomery read a chapter of the Bible every day. So uh, here is wonderful news. We can overcome the devil. Now, in practical terms, how do we do it? Well, it says, be sober. That's the first word. And sometimes you say, that was a sobering experience I had. In other words, you've come through the mill and and it's been very serious. And that's the thought I want to get across to you here. Be serious. Be serious. You know, an American preacher commenting on Ecclesiastes said, life is not a bowl of cherries. Now, you might not even like cherries, but he's really saying, life is not a bundle of laughs. It's a serious business to prepare for eternity. You know, we we are far too frivolous. We're far too frivolous. I'm not saying we can't have fun, that we can't laugh, that we can't smile, that we can't be happy. But I am saying We have a short time to prepare for a great eternity. And the apostle says to us here, be sober, be serious. Take life seriously. Take your soul's concerns seriously. Take eternity seriously. Take the battle against the devil seriously. Take the Lord Jesus Christ seriously. And then he says, be vigilant, be alert, keep a watch on your life. Do you keep a watch on your prayer times? Very easy to clip off a minute or two until there's nothing left. 
Do you keep a watch on your Bible reading? Do you keep a watch on your habits, lest you develop evil habits? And do you keep a watch on your zeal? Am I less zealous than I was 50 years ago, or more than 50, nearly 60 years ago when I was first saved? Am I less zealous now for the Lord? I remember coming home from prayer meetings in Lisbon, or late night prayer meetings, and I remember looking up at the sky and thinking, one day, one day, I'll be above the sky. I'll be above uh, the stars. One day, I'll be there in heaven with Christ. Do I have that zeal today? We've got to be alert. We've got to keep a watch on our lives. Have you lost your appetite for the Word of God? And then it tells us something more. Uh, it says, resist the devil, resist him steadfastly in the faith. That word steadfast indicates a determination. Just like Jacob saying, I'll not let thee go. I am determined. I am determined. I'm determined to go through with God. Those who were mighty for God, they were determined people. My great favorites are George Whitfield and C.H. Spurgeon. I, I, I love those two men. And I love reading about Mary Slessor. And, I, and my favorite missionaries uh, are Hudson Taylor and his wife Maria. How faithful they were. They were determined people. They were determined to serve God. And then it says, resist steadfast in the faith. And we take the faith as the whole spectrum of faith, thinking of who Christ is. What a precious Savior. What a great and glorious Savior. What a loving Savior. A Savior who shed his blood. And we think of him as he is. We think of his power. We think of his eternity. Uh, we think of his majesty and his glory. And then we think of him coming into this world out of pure love living a spotless life, dying on the cross, shedding his blood. And when the devil comes against us, we plead his blood. Revelation 12 and verse 11 says, they overcame the accuser of the brethren by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. We think of the greatness of his salvation, how he lifted us, lifted us out of the dunghill of sin and set us upon a rock and put a new song into our mouth. We think of the promises of God. We think of the presence of Christ. We think of his help. We think of the future glory that awaits the child of God. And we think of the shame of acting unworthily. Yes, resist him steadfastly in the faith. There's a beautiful section at the end of 1 Thessalonians. And it says, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks for. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying. Uh, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil, and so on. Yes, there are short, pithy statements that tell us, I apologize for putting it this way, play the man, play the man. I'm not trying to offend you ladies. Some ladies are far more manly in resisting. In fact, not just some, but many. Probably the vast majority are far more manly in resisting the devil and standing for the truth than many men have proved over the years. But then there's a little bit of comfort, and I'm almost through. A little bit of comfort here. In fact, more than a little bit. It says, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. You're not alone. Sometimes we feel nobody has been tested as I have been tested. We're not alone. The same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. And then, to add to it, those afflictions are only being accomplished in this life. This short life will soon be over. And then all our troubles come to an end. We enter into a world where there's no sin, no sorrow, no sickness, no suffering, no death, no Satan, no temptation. How glorious that is. 
We can win. We will win if we are truly saved. But I say this as a final exhortation to the unsaved. Come to the Savior. Satan's side is a losing side. When Christ spoke about the coming of the Comforter in John chapter 16, he said he'll convince the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And of sin because people didn't believe in him, didn't trust in him. Of righteousness, he said, because I go to the Father. I'm going to be proved to be righteous, to be the Holy One of God, the true Savior, and you will see me at the right hand of the Father, and every knee will bow before me. And then he said of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged, the devil. The devil can't win. He will be judged. You side with him, you side with the greatest loser. You lose your soul alongside the devil. Hell is a place not prepared, the Bible suggests, for men, prepared for the devil and his angels. Why follow him? Why follow him to perdition when you can come to Christ and receive forgiveness and peace with God? We'll bow together in a closing word of prayer. I do apologize. I've run well over my time. And uh, it's not a good habit in Tandragi, but it's done. And uh, trust the Lord will bless his truth. Father in heaven, we pray that thou wilt write thy word upon our hearts. We pray, Lord, that we might see that we have an adversary, the devil, roaring as a lion, seeking whom he may devour. And thou hast told us that we are to resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in our brethren that are in the world. Separate us in thy fear, and with thy love and blessing, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.